Yeah, the growth hormone, yeah, it makes people ugly when they get old, it makes you big when you're small, and it makes, it puts the you in the ugly when you have too much of it, when you get older, you get big hat, big ring, big nose, big toes, big, mm, all sorts of things that have bone and cartilage, growth hormone. Funny thing is, it doesn't actually cause growth in adults. Hmm, bad name. So intrauterine growth is really very highly regulated by growth hormone. Now, the growth hormone makes IGF, insulin-like growth factor. I don't think it's that important to know the difference between IGF-1 and IGF-2, because the major issue is, is that they're insulin-like growth factors because they both work through tyrosine kinase. So you might say, what is so insulin-like about a substance that raises glucose and raises free fatty acids? That's not very insulin-like. Well, that's because the growth hormone effect is not insulin-like. The growth hormone effect is actually anti-insulin. Why do we call it growth hormone? Well, I don't know. Why do we park in a driveway and drive in a parkway? Why do we call it sunrise and sunset when the earth turns? I don't know, Copernicus. That's just the way it is. It's called growth hormone, even though it's not growth. Okay, the growth part is to the IGF. Now, the other thing about it is that insulin is also anabolic, and that has also a big participation in making proteins grow. Now, this is also part of the reason why infants of diabetic mothers are especially big, very dangerously big. Smoking decreases the vascularity of the placenta, and actually, why is smoking uh, just makes tiny babies, so maybe you're worried. Maybe you should, if you're a diabetic mother, maybe you should smoke and keep the birth weight down. No, that probably is not a good idea. So um, the other thing is, what we are making a point here is that when the baby's too big, it's bad. Insulin, growth, bad, dangerous, 10 pounds, dangerous. Baby small, bad, dangerous. Goldilocks and the three babies. Ooh, that in diabetes, this baby is too big. Ooh, smoking. Ooh, this baby is too small. You have to get that baby just right. So fetal hypothyroidism is not as important. It's later on after you deliver that the hypothyroidism damages the brain. See, following delivery is when it's a problem. It damages growth. And that's why it is that low thyroid hormone as a child or infant damages the growth, which you can actually fix if you catch it early enough. That's why thyroid hormone is mandatorily tested in all babies after they're born because they can replace it and it can solve the problem. That's why none of us will see cretinism where you have access to care because it gets tested on the heel stick at birth. And the other thing is that glucocorticoids slow growth because glucocorticoids, when you give too much of them, will take the proteins and convert them into sugar. That's the problem with glucocorticoid excess. Growth hormone pre-puberty is giantism. Growth hormone decrease pre-puberty is a dwarf. Excess pre-puberty is giant. Deficiency pre-puberty is a dwarf. Excess as an adult is acromegaly. Deficiency as an adult doesn't do too much. Doesn't do too much. But pubertal growth hormone deficiency is with congenital defects, there is a decreased birth length when you have a deficiency because growth hormone makes the IGF, and so therefore, if you're deficient, it makes you small. And sometimes you're missing growth hormone releasing hormone. Where's the growth hormone releasing hormone come out of? comes out of the hypothalamus, so sometimes you can have a hypothalamic defect. And this is a fancy way of saying short, delayed skeletal maturation, prone to hypoglycemia, chubby and immature facial appearance. Sounds like me sometimes. Looks like me when I'm sleeping. Now, acquired deficiency is in you have a tumor squishing the hypothalamic pituitary axis. That's when you have an acquired deficiency as an adult or later on in childhood. Growth hormone was invented some time ago to treat dwarfism. Now, the number of children with dwarfism is very small, but it did have a little side project, didn't it? Yeah, called professional athletes using it all the time. It was invented for this, for Laurent dwarfism, and for making sure that they had normal stature. 
But it turns out if you give the same recombinant growth hormone to adults, makes their muscles grow, makes their red cells grow. Ooh, now you got extra red cell, extra oxygen carrying capacity. Very nice. Telling growth hormone deficiency can be very difficult. You can give them insulin and try to see if it stimulates growth hormone release. But it's pretty dangerous, isn't it? Insulin will cause hypoglycemia. So instead, we do a stimulatory test with arginine. You give an amino acid, and the amino acid will normally, should normally stimulate growth hormone release because amino acids are going to be used to make protein. So growth hormone deficiency follow puberty may have some effect on decreasing muscle mass. Certainly excess increases muscle mass. Excess increases it. That's why athletes use it. So Laurent dwarfism is with tissue resistance to growth hormone, and you just give a synthetic IGF, give synthetic insulin-like growth factor. You see, the insulin-like part with the insulin-like growth factor, the insulin-like part is the part that affects protein growth, not the sugar part. So this slide summarizes the release of growth hormone. From the hypothalamus, you have growth hormone, releasing hormone. The SST stands for somatostatin. Somatostatin decreases growth hormone. Well, the major effect is the releasing hormone. That's why when you cut the pituitary stalk, you get a decrease in growth hormone because the major effect is the growth hormone releasing hormone. If the major effect was the somatostatin, that would mean if you cut the pituitary stalk, you'd increase growth hormone production, but you don't. So we have to divide up the growth hormone effect into two parts. The direct effect of growth hormone, which is a peptide hormone, as is everything just about coming out of the pituitary, is an anti-insulin. It raises glucose, it raises free fatty acids, it causes lipolysis, it causes gluconeogenesis. It is a stress hormone that does almost identical things as glucagon or catecholamines. But the indirect portion, the IGF portion, is the protein growing effects. The indirect is the protein growing effect. The direct is an anti-insulin. So let's say it again. Growth hormone directly causes high glucose and high free fatty acids. Growth hormone is a stress hormone like cortisol, catecholamines, glucagon, cortisol, catecholamines, glucagon, cortisol, catecholamines, glucagon. And we'll say again, the last time in this section, all the things that stress hormones do. They cause lipolysis, they cause gluconeogenesis, they cause glycogenolysis. But what's different is the effect on IGF. The IGF, the insulin-like growth factor, used to be called somatomedin, comes out of liver and skeletal muscle to increase production of proteins. Insulin-like growth factor is a huge major anabolic factor. It makes muscles grow, it makes bones grow, it makes proteins grow. Looks a little like uh, pro-insulin and has insulin-like activity in the sense of tyrosine kinase. Now, IGF is also the best initial test for acromegaly because it's a transvestite peptide, meaning that on the inside it functions like a peptide but likes to dress up like a, like a steroid, okay? And so therefore, as a transvestite, on the inside, it's functions. Actually, here's the question for you. Are most transvestites heterosexual or homosexual? The answer is they're mostly heterosexual, just like to dress up like the other side. Okay. So therefore, as a transvestite, it has a peptide, uh, it's a peptide hormone, meaning it works through a G protein, works through second messengers. But it has a long half-life because it's got a protein carrier. And, I, and they increase lean body mass, and they also have this effect in grown-ups as well. Now, that's why it is that you have bodybuilders who abuse uh, growth hormone. They have wonderful large deltoids, and they make an excellent viewing in a casket when they drop dead of coronary disease when they're 35 years old. 
So I got some good news and some bad news. The good news is you're going to have cardiomyopathy and coronary disease and a myocardial infarction by 32. Seen it many times. But the bad news is, is that you're going to be dead. But you're going to have the best looking body at a funeral home. I said that to a patient once. He goes, you really think so, Doc? So as a stress hormone, it has the same things controlling its secretion as all other stress hormones. Pain, fever, anxiety, and especially hypoglycemia. But what's different is deep sleep. The same way we repair the trains, the subways, and the roadways at night, we have the maximum growth hormone and IGF secretion at night because that's when we want to build all the proteins when we don't need them. And the only other exception for what inhibits it is IGF. Somatostatin inhibits it the same way somatostatin inhibits all hormones. That's not an exception. The same way glucose inhibits all the stress hormones. But IGF inhibits it. That's the exception. Deep sleep in the middle of the night. And that's why we don't use growth hormone as a diagnostic test because it's in the middle of the night and it's got a short half-life. That's why we use IGF. But the most accurate test is giving glucose and seeing whether it suppresses. Then finally you scan it and remove it. Now, what makes puberty happen is not clear. You have the hypothalamus increases activity. We don't know why. And you start getting breast development. You start getting estrogen producing uh, uh, ducts. And that's all happening. But what stimulates all these to happen? What's the trigger to make it start? We don't know. We do know this is that you've got to have thyroid hormone to release growth hormone. You're going to have growth hormone to have pubertal growth spurt. But the stimulant to start it all, the trigger point that starts the whole activity, is not clear. So again, in puberty, you need thyroid hormone to release growth hormone. You need the growth hormone to have puberty. If you don't have thyroid hormone, you don't have growth hormone. If you don't have growth hormone, there's no pubertal growth spurt. The androgens come out of the testicles, and yeah, in some women there's also uh, their DHEA and androstenedione dione come out of the adrenals. And at the end of puberty, androgens are going to stop the growth by having a squirt of androgens that actually stops epiphyseal growth. So we know that by 18 or so, women stop growing, and by men, it's about 21. But the things that start it are just not clear. Acromegaly is a disease of overproduction. Growth hormone deficiency has limited symptoms in adults, but growth hormone excess, whether it's from your pituitary lesion or it's from people who take it therapeutically or abuse it, cause you to have big nose, big toes, big rings, and mostly also simulate a diabetic hypertensive hyperlipidemic. There is a pituitary macroadenoma. There's pituitary adenoma. And it's very slow in onset because it takes a long time to watch those proteins grow. The ectopic production of growth hormone, releasing hormone, like out of the hypothalamus, is a very, very, very rare entity. But you do get increased IGF that results in acromegaly. But what really gets you is that growth hormone causes you to have hyperglycemia, and hyperlipidemia. That combined with the fact that you have an excess growth of your heart. You get increased growth of your blood vessels, so you get hypertension. It narrows the blood vessels. So you get hypertension, hyperlipidemia, because remember, growth hormone is a stress hormone that raises glucose. Growth hormone is a stress hormone that raises lipids. And then you die by the time you're 50. Most giants are in wheelchairs by 45 or 50 and dead by 55. Big cat, big ring, big jaw. And remember, it's not big normal. You're misshapen. Your jaw hurts. You have a deformant arthritis, a cardiomyopathy that makes you short of breath. The hands and feet growing are not as much of a problem as the fact that your megagnathia, that's a big fancy word for saying big jaw, and you can't use it. You don't get into trouble from a big hat size. You get into trouble because your knees are out of alignment, and so is your spine. 
And then the bones crush your nerves. You have a terrible radiculopathy, terrible misshapen joints. And one of the other thing is calcium pyrophosphate deposition disease. So the best initial test for acromegaly is not a growth hormone. It's an IGF level because the IGF level is protein bound and therefore has a long half-life. The growth hormone level is elevated, but only in the middle of the night. So therefore, we don't want to test something that is going to be up in the middle of the night when there's nobody there to check it. Now, you notice that dead last, whatever we check, we always check the scan last. And the reason that we check the scan last is that 10% of the population has pituitary lesions. 4% of the general population has adrenal lesions. If we scan the brain first, we could end up removing the gland inappropriately. So in endocrinology, you always confirm biochemically before you scan anybody. So you confirm biochemically before you scan. Then you got to knock out the thing with surgery. Now, this is the only one here that can sometimes not get fixed with surgery, meaning that you can remove it, and then all of a sudden it's still really growing there, and you have other medications. But first surgery, but even after you remove it, it can continue to over-secrete. So what do we do if somebody continues to over-secrete despite surgical removal? Here's a new drug for you, Pegvisomant. Pegvisomant is a growth hormone receptor antagonist. As a growth hormone receptor antagonist, it's a unique drug. Octreotide is artificial somatostatin. And artificial somatostatin decreases hormone release. Cabergoline is a dopamine agonist. It's like bromocryptine, but with less side effects. And radiation is always dead last, because you have to radiate all this normal tissue in the middle. So acromegaly, big ring, big nose, big toes, big jaw. But remember, acromegaly also gives you misshapen joints, colonic polyps. It gives you obstructive sleep apnea as it closes off your airway. It gives you carpal tunnel syndrome as it squeezes your median nerve. Our IGF level is first. Glucose suppression is the most accurate test. Finally, you scan surgical removal. And if surgical removal does not work, pegvisomant, cabergoline, the dopamine agonist, Octreotide. Then finally, if nothing else works, you put their head in the microwave with radiation. See you in the next section.